Everybody, welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. It is your Tuesday edition. Hope you had a great trading session out there. Hope you were short on some of them cryptos as well. Um, I always encourage you guys to bring on, or at least let me know about people in the industry that you find interesting, that have uh, great arguments about a specific asset class, whether it's bullish, bears. I don't care. It's nice to get people's opinions from different perspectives so we can formulate our own opinions about where we think things are going to go. Now, I forgot who sent this gentleman to me, but you sent me a video over the weekend, and it was a great video talking about potential issues with the bond market. Of course, last week we had a bunch of discussions with uh, on bonds with Jim Rogers and Bill Addis, but I uh, this one was a very different perspective on it. So we're going to be joined today by a gentleman who's in California, so it's a California brotherhood today. We're going to talk about the bond squeeze, bond markets. My guest today is Stephen Van Meter, CFP. Stephen, welcome to the show. Hey, hi, Merlin. Thanks for having me. I, I'm, I'm happy to have you on. You have a lot more followers, so that's obviously a good thing, too. But uh, hopefully we can bring some new viewers to you because you put out a ton of great content. Uh, by the way, you should all check out his YouTube page because he does three shows a week on macro markets, and he does one on Sunday called Sunday Night Charts, which is just awesome, great content for you as well. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself, Stephen. I want to know three basic questions. What, what instruments do you trade? How long you've been trading? And the final one is what time frames would you say that you, uh, you trade? Yeah, so those are great questions. I've been investing since I was, uh, I think, 16, maybe, maybe a little younger, but definitely uh, in my teens. My, my dad got me started early. Uh, today, I use ETFs uh, exclusively as a money manager. Uh, I not only is that the easiest tool to use, but I always personally myself use the same things as my clients. I, I like to be familiar with what I'm using. Uh, time frames, uh, three to five years. Wow, okay, long term. Yeah, macro. Yeah. And, and you're pretty much with everything, right? I mean, I noticed through you're, you're doing equities, you're doing bonds, it, it, whatever is an opportunity out there, right? Well, I mean, it is as a investment professional, you can't just say I'm. Well, I mean, you can. You can say I'm going to be specific in this, but you know, you've got to be able to uh, be what the masses need. You know, and people are very comfortable with equities. I may personally not be, but hey, there's a lot of people that like them, so I obviously need to have something for them. Excellent. Um, all right, let, let's go and start off with the topic du jour. I'll go through the, the bond squeeze graphic we created here. Uh, I love the Bond King hat, by the way. I do like your little crown that you wear when you talk about bonds. Um, in that video, you were talking about, you know, the, obviously the market has been just crushing bonds to the south side. We've been seeing yields spike. And, and the, tra the trajectory, I think, is what concerns a lot of people and how quickly it's changing. But you make a very compelling argument that we could actually see those yields come crashing back down due to a squeeze on the bond market. You want to explain that a little bit? Yeah, and I think part of the before we get into the the squeeze is why does that happen? Why why will interest rates fall? Why will treasury yields fall? And virtually nobody thinks that's possible. Is when you're at this stage in a recession or slowdown in the economy you get this view that inflation is coming. So people start bidding and shorting the bond market so that way they can drive yields up. The problem occurs is there's not enough money supply growth to support those higher yields. And so rather than it lead to an expansion of credit as money is chasing you know, loans, it actually leads to a deceleration and, and even worst case scenario, contraction in credit. And so ultimately you get lower interest rates, which again is something that very few people understand. Mm -hmm. uh, to couple that with, I mean, one of the things we know is obviously the Fed keeps the short end of that yield curve. Uh, you know, they're manipulating that one. And of course, we can make the argument they're manipulating everything. Uh, no, 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 no. They're not buying T-bills at all. They're, but that's the question I'm going to say. Is there, are they going to move into buying a longer term maturities to bring in that long end of the yield curve? They already are. They've, they've been buying. That's, and that's one of the things that people don't understand is like, how can you be bullish on bonds? Well, for starters, the Fed's buying ten and a half billion of thirty years, specifically thirty year bonds per month. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the treasury auctions and assuming that the primary dealer banks are flipping their entire take to the Fed every month, well, the primary dealers are picking up on average about five billion in new issuance a month, leaving a short market short of about five and a half billion. So the dealers have to source five and a half billion 
of 30-year treasuries from the open market just to feed the Fed. So yeah, they're only buying notes and bonds. They're not buying any bills right now. Yeah, um, I, I guess maybe my, my example is historically they have been, and it's, it seems to me like that's right. going to be their move is to jump into those longer term because you, know, you let that long term rise, all of a sudden creates havoc for the financial markets. Now, one of the arguments you pointed out was that there's two to one shorts. Was some, I think that's what I heard you say in that one, that there's oh. kind of two to one shorts in the bonds. And I was like, well, wait a minute. GameStop was only 138% short, and that was an unbelievable squeeze. What the hell is going to happen to bonds? <laughs> yeah, I, I, if I said, well, since I don't edit my show, I'm never sure of what I, I say. I do prone to make mistakes, <laughs> as we talked about before. Uh, so if we look at the big picture, there's this massive short position in bond futures. And probably the largest, is specifically if we look at the 30-year, which is, was a four standard deviation short, is probably now about three and a half standard deviations, but it's still uh, in the realm of, there's never been a larger short position in the long bond, but all the, across the curve from notes uh, into bonds, there's a massive short position. You look at securities like TLT, it has the short interest is the highest in three years. You look at CTAs or quant computer models, they are short across the, not just US government bonds, but all domestic uh, major government bonds, not domestic, but uh, foreign government bonds as well. So they're massively short the bond market. You've got uh, retail investors short on it through options, and you've got, you know, you can even back out pensions funds are short the bond market. Institutional money managers are short treasuries because they don't own them. Right. So if you look at really what's going on is everybody right now is short the bond market, and anyone who isn't is looking to get short because, hey, that's, the trade to be in is short bond markets. Interest rates can only go up. You know, I'm looking at the chart here um, of of TLT in particular, and it's one of those things where it's like if you if you weren't if you're trying to short now, where were you? You know, six months ago. I mean, obviously the TLT has been traversing side. Oops, I just moved my charts. Off. The beautiful part about live TV. Um, has been traversing sideways, had that big chop, you know, from March all the way through August, and all of a sudden we've been in this prolonged downtrend starting in August of last year. So, you know, this is one of those, uh, the analogy is the trend is your friend to the bend at the end. But what we're seeing now, particularly on TLT, uh, my viewers know I'm a big fan of volume. I think you are as well. Yeah. Is you have climactic volume on TLT, and it's not just TLT; it's other bond products. And to me, that usually signifies a, a turn in price. Not that it's the the absolute reversal of price, but just that there might be a turn. What's your take on you know potentially the bottoming out of bonds, that, or, or maybe have bond, bottomed out already? Yeah, I, I I do think this is bottom. I'll, I'll tell you what is kind of you nailed it on the head with volume. If you look at last Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then on Monday, if you take the total trading volume of TLT and then cut it in half because we know half are buyers, half are sellers, and then you go look at how many shares are issued. There's 99 million shares of TLT out there. 69% mm -hmm. of all shares in TLT traded hands in those four days. <laughs> that's now, crazy. if someone wants to tell me that that's just a tr like a short-term positional change, like I, I would like to know why 69% of those shares traded hands and the people that bought them are going to turn around and sell them. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to happen. You know, and it, it goes back to historically, retail investors are typically on the wrong side. I mean, it, it's it's a horrible thing to say. What statistics and math shows that retail traders are generally wrong? Is that what you're chalking that up to? Is just kind of the retail sellers saying, "Hey, I'm either selling my TLT or I'm jumping on the short wagon because the trend is so strong down." And they here we are right at the bottom. Yeah, there's that, and then I think some of the CTA models uh, went into maximum short positions around uh, the ten year hitting one and a half percent. And you know that that's a mistake that I think a lot of investors make is like, hey, look, there's going to be times you're on the wrong side of the market. Now, depending on what it is you're in. Now, if you're triple short something and on the wrong side, that, that's a whole totally different answer. But if you're sitting in bonds, which are pay you an interest rate, and you're on the wrong side of the market, well, you can just wait. I mean, if you sell low to go buy high and hope it goes higher, you know, you run the risk of being in the wrong spot again. So sometimes a prudent move is. Just take a step back, look at the macro lay dynamic, look at your data and be like, all right, well, eh, it's not that bad. And then you see the volume there and you go, okay, I know this is gonna reverse and I know everyone's short this thing. And short squeezes can get really, really violent to the upside. So it's like, yeah, why would I wanna get out of this uh, when I know everyone's on the wrong side of this market? Um, you know, you mentioned some sources that you had for looking at the the short interest. Now, with equity markets, you know, I I'm I'm been shorting for years ever since I started short term trading back in the late '90s. Um, you know, shorting for me was the holy grail because I never heard about this in college. 
with the bond markets, it seems to me like that might not be as transparent to see what what percentage of those bonds are short. You know, I can go and pull up lists right now of shorted stocks, heavily shorted ones, and just buy those because they'll shoot up like Rocket did today and, and, and GameStop and AMC. With bonds, is it is it a lot trickier to spot that short interest? Because I, I think you've got connections so you can see it. I, I, I don't have those connections. Yeah, there's some places that I found data. The problem with the bond market, that you, the reason you can't see it is because of how shorts can happen. And when when someone comes along with shorts a bond, they actually borrow it from the dealer. And the dealer still holds the original version, and they actually make a copy of that bond. I mean, it's identical. And, and so they give that to the short seller. The short seller sells it on the market, receives the money for it, and then usually goes out and buys risk assets. And that's why we see the relationship that interest rates rise and stock prices rise generally together and fall together. Now the problem is, if you look at the bond market, the treasury bond market, there are people that have done some research, and not many of them, but a few people have tried to figure out for every one real bond, how many copies of them are out there, and the answer is over two. Yeah, that's crazy. And how, so how do you account for that if, if, if you know, Merlin, I came down and visited you and I made a copy of your car, an identical copy of it, how would we know which one's the original? Because they're identically the same. Yeah. And so that's the problem. There's no way to really account for just how big this is. But when you get the short selling happening, the reason you get these large moves in the bond market is because they can make multiple copies of this bond and just dump it onto the market and dump it onto the market. Now the challenge though is once all that supply is absorbed up and everyone reaches their limits and says, okay, I've shorted everything I want to short and I, I, you know, my goal is full of shorting, well, the reversal becomes painful because now they've got to go out you know, when they, the squeeze happens and they've got to go get a bond and there's a lot of them, but they're all held by a small number of people who don't want to sell. Yeah. Well, any time horizon on that squeeze? I mean, I mean, I, I know this isn't a Wall Street bets user group, you know. I mean, it's probably, I'm going to call you deep F in value. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah. But are, are there warning signs that for you were kind of shots across the bow that say this is happening or it's about to happen? I know short squeezes are almost impossible to predict when they finally do strike. But is there anything that you look at from the bond market perspective which might signal that coming? Well, more along the lines, I look at the economic data, and everyone is misinterpreting a lot of it. I, the the biggest misinterpretation is you get out of the ISM uh, data, where everyone looks at a high ISM. Specifically, I like that price is paid subsector of it. Is they say, look, it's really high. That means there's more inflation coming. That's not a, that is not actually what it means. What it means is this is a spot look at where we are today. What it's saying is prices have been rising. And the odds of them continuing to rise is actually decreasing as the ISM goes higher. But again, specifically, the price is paid. Mm -hmm. uh, I look at uh, the money supply data, the monetary base data, because we're stuck in a liquidity trap, and a lot of people don't understand that you know, when you have money growth outpacing money supply growth, aggregate prices have to fall. So you start looking at some of this underlying data, the unemployment data, and you're like, wait a minute. I mean, you look at the banking data. I mean, massive deceleration there. You see the banks, the financial conditions of banks are tighter than they were in the financial crisis, so they're not lending. And, and you've got the Fed buying bonds. You look at all this situation, and you go like, I don't know when it turns, but all I know is everyone's on the wrong side of this market. And this is, in fact, we have not only just the largest short position probably in history against the bond market, you have the largest bet on inflation in the history of the market. There are more money crammed in inflation sensitive assets than ever. And they're all off sides. They don't know it yet. Mm -hmm. But when they figure it out, well, they're going to come running to the bond kingdom. <laughs> Bring it to the bond kingdom. Do you think that has to do with the way that we've been taught? I mean, I don't know your, your education with regards to college degree, but I know mine was uh, definitely a Keynesian perspective. And it was when you have massive printing of money like this or just a gigantic increase of money supply, not necessarily printing, we know it's digital, um, that it's going to lead to hyperinflation at some point. And really, you know, we haven't seen that type of perspective. But I think what you're saying is it feels like everyone's positioned themselves for that inflation, but it's, you know, where is it at, right? Well, that's the problem is everyone thinks quantitative easing is money printing, whether it's physical or digital. It's actually neither. I mean, it's not, it doesn't print money at all. And everyone is looking at the money supply data and completely misinterpreting. They don't they don't actually understand what they're saying. So when someone comes to me and says, Look, the money supply is growing, it's inflationary, it's like you, you don't understand what you're looking at. You've no they really don't. They're totally misreading the whole deal. So the if you go looking for inflation, you can find it. Sure. But what you're looking at isn't actually inflation, it's completely misread. 
And so well, that's ultimately why the market is mis, uh, misaligned is because people don't know what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you know, another part that I thought was interesting is you talked about gold signaling deflation. And we've got some uh, we've got some metal lovers here in our audience today that are definitely looking at going long gold and silver. Walk us through your argument for deflationary environment right now with what you're seeing in gold. Well, I actually give you the better argument. Let's look at the inflationary argument. If there is all this money printing, then why isn't gold going up? I mean, that's a simple answer. If we literally have all this inflation and money printing and easy monetary policy, then that's what I want to own. But yeah. yet gold is going down. So it doesn't really make any sense unless the actual view of the whole market is completely wrong. In that case, financial conditions are tightening and people can't see it. And gold is just a response to that. And then, so what will happen is at some point we should see gold continue to fall and then bonds, and normally people, a lot of people understand that bonds and gold are actually trade all similar. They, they're, they're very highly correlated, but there is a point where they flip, where bonds will start to rally, gold will continue to fall. That's your risk off move. So gold is actually just following bond prices lower, but what will happen is it will start to trigger a rally in the dollar. So the dollar's real weak. And we know that gold and the dollar are not always inversely correlated, but they're frequently inversely mm -hmm. correlated. And so what will happen is all of a sudden there'll be a risk off move. The dollar will start to go up. Dollar is just a zero duration bond effectively. Bonds start to go up, major risk off move. And then again, it comes back to the fact, if this was all happening and we were allegedly money printing, then gold should be going up, not down. So is it a question of one of these things gonna break one way or the other? Because I mean, you know, in theory, which I think what most people believe is we are in an inflationary environment or heading towards. Of course, the Fed targeting 2%. Who knows what that joke's all about? But, um, you know, in theory, you would see gold pick up. So are you are you bullish on gold? Uh, over the long term, but I've always said that when I sell bonds, I will be buying, you know, a lot of, a lot of gold because what will happen is when bonds peak, gold's going to be crashing down at the bottom. Yeah. Um, one thing that has uh, concerned me with regards to the bond market is, you know, historically, and you're a certified financial planner, so you've, you've done a lot more education than I have, but when I was getting my finance degree and I worked for a financial planning firm, you know, there's this cookie cutter model where it's like, okay, take your age, subtract that from 100, and that should be your percentage that you're going to be in equities, right? So, okay, I'm, I'm 40 years old, I need to be 60% bonds and 40, or sorry, 60% equities, 40% bonds. You know, that is such a, a cliche cookie cutter thing. But what it does tell us is that those that are nearing retirement or getting near should be more heavily allocated in bonds. And I am, you know, for the past couple of years, I've been just, you know, uh, upset or frustrated because it's putting people in an asset class, which historically has been very safe. But given the volatility going on now, it, it, are bonds really that safe for somebody that's in their golden years? Well, yeah, if you think the yields are going to zero, like I do, there's a <laughs> amount you know, price. You know, I, I, I'll, people think, like, they'll email me and say, well, I don't understand why you're the bond king. Do you really like making 2% interest? <laughs> and the answer is that's not why I invest in bonds. I invest in them just like someone would buy an equity. I'm looking at uh, if the 30-year long bond goes to zero or near zero, you're talking potential 40% upside return mm -hmm. somewhere. I haven't run the numbers here recently, but the upside return is substantial. So the reality is for someone older is, yeah, I mean, who cares about the interest on it? What you're looking for is price appreciation. Yeah, well, I mean, what we've seen, you know, speaking recently has been the exact opposite of that, though. You know, you look into the TLT, which I'll bring back up here, you know, that someone who's been holding bonds, and yes, it's a small window of time, just the past six, eight months, but, you know, you're down pretty significantly, and, and I, I know that there's some people who are feeling some pain out there. I agree with you long term, you're probably safe, but, you know, the shorter term end of that is going to hurt some people, I think. Yeah, it comes back to investing time horizons. But if you pull a chart of, say, the 30-year yield or 10-year, doesn't matter, pick any one you want. Yeah, I've got them up. These backups and yields are always rejected, and they're rejected with lower yields, with yields making new all-time lows. And it simply comes back to where we started the conversation of there isn't sufficient money supply growth to handle these higher interest rates. I mean, the evidence was clear last week uh, on Wednesday when we saw mortgage applications drop 11 percent. Now we get the data tomorrow, but it's just evidence that if you're going to have higher interest rates, which is fine, if that's what we want, we got we can have it, but we have to have enough money supply growth to back it up, and we don't. I mean, the money supply, uh, even unfortunately, has now gone to monthly due to Regulation D, but just prior to that, over the last three weeks, it was dead flat at zero. 
and then you add the negative multiplier of quantitative easing. So you actually have a negative, uh, a falling money supply growth. And there's no way you can support higher interest rates. I mean, it's, it's not even possible. So that's why what happens is all these shorts, uh, you'll get massively squeezed out and you see uh, on these long-term charts that every move higher in yields just slam down. I mean, because everyone finds out that, hey, I'm on the wrong side of the fence and I got to get back over. And it turns out, well, everyone's on the wrong side of the fence. And mm -hmm. the next thing you know, yields come crashing down. Bond prices go straight up, gold comes down, risk off of that, and uh, that's uh, that's the move right there. Yeah, well, it, it, it's that giant jigsaw puzzle with all these moving parts. It's actually, I, it, people call it a jigsaw puzzle. I call it like opening up a classic watch. It's got all these different dials in it, and every single one of them is moving and telling you something different. Um, in watching what you post on your YouTube channel, you are definitely a lot into the fundamentals, and obviously I think we should all pay attention to the fundamentals because it gives us clues as to the economy and things. Just curious, how, how trustworthy do you find him? I interviewed a guy, I'll give you a reason why I say this. I interviewed a guy from the Bureau of Labor Statistics five years ago. He was a former employee. And I asked him, I said, you know what, I'm a trader, I'm an investor, so I rely on that data being legit. And mm -hmm. I said, do you ever cook the books? Do you ever manipulate the data? And he goes, we actually do. We manipulate it to fit the political agenda. And at that moment in time, my belief, trust in the data just went out the window. And I, it's, you seem like someone who relies on it heavily for your decision. So how, how well do you take in and trust that data? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. He is right. The BLS, uh, the, 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 the monthly unemployment report is probably the most faked report the government puts out. It started back uh, when Ronald Reagan was president facing a double dip recession. And uh, he to get out of that, uh, the second one, they figured out that maybe if we just let people know there's a few more employed than there actually were, that <laughs> they would go out and spend and it worked. And so the idea became is, look, we'll, we'll put out a number that's you know, somewhere around the ballpark and then we'll clean it up about a year and a half later, which is why they get these big revisions in it. Uh, I don't actually care for that report at all. I know the market likes it, but there's a lot of other data out there uh, that's not specifically government you know, generated data. I mean, like the weekly unemployment data is not faked. Uh, I mean, it, sometimes it's not correct because they're miscount. They got the count slightly wrong, but they fix it the next week. And there's a lot of other data out there that is not run by the government that I like to look at. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I can trust the data. And part of the reason is my time frame is, you know, a lot right. longer. As you kind of mentioned earlier, people are, you know, all of the trend on TLT and, and bonds is terrible. It's like a lot of people now... And they trade their accounts more than they change their clothes. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, the art of long-term investing. I mean, I remember when people bought a mutual fund and stayed in for years or bought stock and held it for years. That doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I just kind of represent the long-lost art of taking a long-term view and seeing where you think it's going to go and then you know, placing a big bet on it and kicking back and just making sure your data is right. Uh, I mean, even if it goes against you, as long as the trend is still correct, uh, it pays out big, and, and that's where you hear from people like you know Jeff Gunlock, and they asked him, well, a uh, great interview with Ralph Powell, he asked him, you know, why do you invest so long, and why don't you do your clients that way? And he goes, well, the, we found out that a client can handle an 18-month investment. That's as far as they can go, and if we don't sell it 19 months, they start complaining. And he's like, but you're really, really successful. He's like, yeah, because I take long-term views, and I take really big bets on them, and they pay out. You know, and so that's what I do. I think I think it's an easier way to. to uh, to go yeah um, all right cool um, yeah for my it's been tough for me and I mean, I, it's funny because I worked for a financial planning firm when I started um, back in 1998 well 96 this was a financial planning firm but then I, I I've discovered day trading back in the late 90s you know of course the gold rush of day trading and uh, fundamental analysis really just went out the window and now that I'm, I'm older and more mature and have, have taken my licks I find this kind of nice merge between technicals and fundamentals uh, which I think is kind of the sweet spot but I always have a little jaded piece of me with regards to economic data because I just don't trust like like the 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 best one is crude oil inventories like I'll say oh I think we're gonna see a contraction of 1.2 million barrels and next thing you know you got an 8 billion barrels sur surplus like wait how can you be wrong by 9 million barrels of oil well oil is the most manipulated market in the world but uh, I mean there's other things like the bank lending data and there's other stuff out there that, that is you know, granted, it doesn't come out perfect, but they, it's quickly revised in the weeks that follow. I mean, it's, there's, there's data out there that I think, you know, like the ISM data, I mean, it's, that's definitely not faked. I mean, it's a, yeah. a third-party company doing a survey. It's not government agency. So there, there's stuff out there. Yeah. Uh, Thomas says, so isn't QE deflationary in general even prior to the pandemic? Absolutely. Q, I mean, the whole point. 
you know, that's what people don't understand about QE. The whole purpose, there's two things that QE does. It does it's designed to strengthen the currency. So in, in our case, to, to cause the dollar to go higher, even though I know it's gone lower because people are shorting it, and it's, cause, it's designed to cause interest rates to go lower. Now I know they've gone higher because again, everyone's shorting it, but the whole point of QE is to get interest rates down and the dollar up so people will borrow money, create new money into the economy, and then spend it. So QE by design is actually deflationary until it becomes inflationary, and it can only become inflationary once people are out borrowing. Yeah. All right. Um, tell me a little about what you do. You're, you're a CFP, Certified Financial Planner. One of the things I thought was interesting um, was your portfolio shield, and I, I, I know people can go check it out, but I wanted to talk about it just because I'm curious because I, I do portfolio management for myself only. I don't manage anybody else's money. Um, but there's a couple unique components to what you do. One of the ones I think is most noteworthy is the monthly rebalancing. So if you guys don't know, he's got a multiple series of... Well, I'll let you explain what the portfolio shield is. Yeah, so... Uh, Merlin, because you've, you've been in the industry and, and you'd understand that things like asset allocation don't really work. In fact, if people really understood how asset allocation works, they wouldn't use it at all. Because the way it works is when the equity market's rising, you're selling stocks to buy bonds. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And when the market's falling and you want your protection, you're selling your bonds, your protection, if you actually own any safe bonds, which usually a lot of asset allocation models will get rid of, I'll explain that in a moment, and to buy stocks on the way down. So what happens on the way up is you've got this diversified pool of equities, and because you're so diversified that, well, some of them just don't perform that well. And to keep the bond component working good, they get rid of all the safe stuff like treasuries, and so that, because what will happen is if these asset allocation models don't do enough, people will leave. But on the way down, because you don't have any safe bonds, you're in trouble. And that's why those things get obliterated. So what I did is I set out to create something a little bit better and that alleviates those problems. One, it doesn't have a broad diversified equity position. It, it concentrates in the three major highest performing U.S. equity funds. And if you're listening and say, don't you need international? No, you don't. You really, I mean, there's enough international exposure in the U.S. indices, you don't really need it. And what it does, what's unique about it is, is because it doesn't sacrifice on the way up, what happens on the way down due to the formula is, is a fully formula-based strategy. So every month I run the formula and adjust the portfolio accordingly, is on the way down, it, if it hits certain trigger points, it starts to hedge with long-term bonds. So it adds on to the bonds, or if it doesn't have any bonds because it's a high-risk strategy, it starts reducing its equity exposure and adding bonds to put a break on the downside move. And what's really interesting about that is it's what you want it to be because you want to sell uh, when you're high, right? So as it's coming down, you want to sell some of your positions. But at the bottom, what's cool about it is the formula figures out within two, you know, as the market's bottoming, that it starts to resell off its bonds near the bottom and buy stocks. And then two months after, it drops all of those extra bonds, all the, the, the bond hedge, and it's buying equities low. I mean, this was exactly what you want to do in a strategy. So pretty much what I did is I just took what was out there and created a by far better version of it. Yeah. I, I like it. I, 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 I'm a huge fan of rebalancing and it's funny when I did financial planning, I was the guy in the back end that was basically just, just compiling all the assets and, and putting them in a spreadsheet and I noticed that so many people would just get from one year to the next, all of a sudden one instrument is went from 20% of the portfolio to 50% of the portfolio and it's like, oh, we'll just keep letting that ride. And it's like, no, the whole point is you want to eliminate, re not eliminate, but let's yeah. reduce some of that risk exposure, spread it around to something that's been undervalued because it most likely will catch up to its, you know, its mean. And it's a very, very powerful tool. So I'm, I'm yeah. guess It's amazing. Investors do not want, hey, if it's going up, I'm not going to sell it. But the reality is, you know, I always kind of use it as when I used to go to Las Vegas and gamble. If I was up, I'd take a few chips and stick them in my pocket. So if I lost the rest of them, at yeah. least I had enough to go buy a drink or something to say, hey, I didn't, I didn't get completely wiped out. And, you know, that, again, is a challenge, as you know, in bull markets is you have investors get concentrated into a smaller and smaller number of positions. And then when it's time to sell, everyone's selling the same stock. Yeah. Um, all right, let's see. Where was I? I'm trying to read through some questions here. They've been coming through fast and furious over here. There's a ton of good stuff. Um, right. Marty says, what effects do you expect on Janet Yellen's TGA spending within the next three to six months? I, I don't need, I don't expect anything. Uh, I mean, in fact, if anything, I expect interest rates to go down, which again, not a lot of people actually. Yeah, your your counter trend. People are now shaking their head and going like, man, this guy really is probably dumb. <laughs> uh, but when you understand what's happening is, uh, first of all, the, the, the spend down of the TGA is not inflationary. Because we're not in a closed system. So it'd be different if all the money 
that went into the TGA came just from the United States. And then if it was, we'd be a closed system, but that's not the case at all. There's plenty of money that comes from non-M2 sources. But what happens is as these stimulus checks hit the bank, you have a problem with too much liquidity in the banking system, which again, some people are taking that and going like, what? Like, yeah, the banks don't want all this cash. But yet, you know, as you know, Berlin, when stimulus checks go out, the data says some people will save it, some people will pay off debt, and then a small percentage of it actually gets spent in the real economy. Well, it's the savings that's the problem because what does a bank got to do with all this new newly deposited money? Well, it's got to pay interest on it. Mm -hmm. And if they're not lending, which they really aren't, to cover, you know, pay that interest, what are they going to do? They're going to go out and they, they buy treasury securities. They, buy, they use T-bills and short-term notes because and that and they take that money and they create a reserve out of it. That's exactly what they do. So what happens is it actually puts pressure on the banks to buy more bonds, which is why we're hearing from the the Treasury that T bill rates could go negative. And the reality is they probably are going to. And if that happens, it's going to drag the two year under 0.1% potentially negative on the two year even and that's just going to destroy the whole rest of the curve will collapse if yeah that so yeah a lot of people think it's massively inflationary there's absolutely no evidence to support that so you you brush on that one and that it's something that we've never seen I, I don't believe in the history of the united states is negative rates at least on the longer term stuff i know that there was uh some on the short term temporarily but what's your take going forward on on the the probability of us having negative rates and what might that impact be for our markets because it's something that at this point, it's just speculation, right? I mean, we haven't seen it, so we don't know what the impacts are going to be. Yeah, so this is kind of interesting because I think it's possible that we could actually get the long end of the curve briefly negative. Now, I, I, I don't think it'll stay there very long, but I'll tell you how it can get there real easily. First of all, you have everyone short, short the long bond they possibly can which we're there now. Mm -hmm. Then you have the Fed chewing up as much of the oversupply that it can, which is currently doing. Then you get a kind of deflationary move, some bad data that says, hey, we're not seeing inflation. And then you start to get a short covering, right? And so all of a sudden people that are piling into bonds and shorts are getting squeezed, and then you see interest rates come down. What then comes down with that will be the CPI because oil will come down, CPI will start coming down. What will the Fed do? Well, they're gonna do more QE. Now, what's interesting, if we go back to March of last year, the Fed was doing QE and T-bills. As you kind of mentioned, Merlin, earlier, that's usually what they focus on. And they got in trouble, you know, because they caused a liquidity problem. Mm -hmm. So the bank said, look, stop doing the T-bills. So the Fed said, fine. But where are the banks position right now? Well, if you look in the futures market, they're massively long the 30 year. They're on the opposite end of the speculative trade. So if you're the banks, right, you're the big commercial banks, and the Fed listens to what you say, and they call you up and say, man, you know, CEO of XYZ Bank, you know, we, we think, you know, we think we need to have to do more QE. And what you know what the CEOs are going to tell the Fed? Yeah, buy the long bond. <laughs> and so the Fed will come in and put pressure on the long bond because the banks need T-bills, two and three year notes, and even five ish. They need those to support all this money that's hitting deposits accounts. So they'll tell the Fed, look, don't touch the short of the curve. You're doing too much as it is. You're driving rates negative. Go buy the long bond. And the next thing you know, you want to see the Fed trigger even the massive bigger short squeeze. Because once they come in and, and vacuum a bunch of those things up, no one will be able to stop it. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's possible. I don't know how if it'll be there an hour or a minute, but it's. I think it is entirely possible the Fed will screw this up that bad. It's just due to market positioning. Yeah. Well, you know, and it, 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 I agree with you. I, I do think it could happen. It seems in. If you asked me five years ago, I'd say it's inconceivable. There's no way you're going to see negative, especially on, on long-term stuff. But, uh, you know. It, after 2020, you may as well just bring it out. Let's go negative. Let's show us aliens and all kinds of other crazy crap that we didn't believe existed before. <laughs> yeah. Now, again, I don't think it stays there very long, but yeah. do I think it's possible that it could blip there for a few minutes? Yeah. And, and if it does, I hope I'm I hope I'm ready to hit the sell button because it'll be a very nice day. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Eric, a good comment. He says, "You want to know when inflation will scream? Bank deposits go down and and, and volume uh, loan volume goes up. That that would certainly be a piece of it." Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I mean, if you want to get inflation, I can tell you exactly how we can do that. One, you can reverse quantitative tightening and raise the federal funds rate. Uh, two, you can do a massive amount of fiscal stimulus. And, uh, oh gosh, what is the third one? Um, shoot, 
uh, forget what the third well, one. Well, I mean, I think one of the third ones, at least one that I could think of, would be, I think it's also part of the listener comment here, is you, you go negative on the short end, your overnight rate, and you force banks to not hold any cash, and therefore they're going to be forced to basically punish us as savers. I won't have any incentive to keep my money in a bank. Let, make me go out there and spend that money. Yeah, and I think that's the, the reason we're seeing all, seeing all this money pile up in the money supply that people can perceive as inflationary isn't. It, so this kind of really ties together nicely because, you know, if CD rates, so let's say, I, let's say I've got money deposited in my savings account and maybe I'm, I'm not, I don't need it right now, so I'm gonna go out and say I'm gonna go buy a five-year CD with some of it. Well, if if the cost of time my money to get a, like a fraction of literally a fraction of a percent more, a negligible percent more, I'm not gonna do that. And so what happens is you get all this money piling up in, in deposit accounts. What you need to do is get, get it out. Well, how do you get it out? Not lower rates, which is what all the central bankers think, but I guarantee you if the 30-year long bond was at 8% right now, there'd be a hell of a lot of money leaving the banking system because that means the whole curve is higher. Yeah. And people would be like, you know what? I would gladly go buy and put my money out in corporate or other type of bonds, treasuries, because there's interest there. And that's the fallacy here is that people think shorter rates are the answer that that or lower short-term rates the answer no it's not the answer at all yeah long term oh it, oh here the third item is we need massive amounts of bank lending and we're not getting that either that that's the third thing you want inflation you really want inflation you need to have money creation well how do you create money through, through new loan origination mm -hmm. well you know my part of my thinking i'm actually looking to buy a home here recently or soon is simply because i, I do think you're going to see those rates rise and and of course this is just a difference of mindset but it's like lock in having a 30-year fixed under three percent is inconceivable five years ago and now all of a sudden it's the norm um you know who knows what that historical norm will be is it five six seven percent for a 30-year fix but lock in a piece of property is my goal what seven is, is a historical norm but if i'm right i think you'll see a 30-year uh somewhere between one and a half and two percent Whew, man Good one. All right, last one. I know I'm taking you long here. Uh, cryptocurrencies is a big favorite of our a lot of our audience out there. I'm a pretty big fan. I'd like to get your take on the crypto space because to me, uh, you talk about DeFi, decentralized finance, and what it could potentially do. How do you feel about cryptos? I don't follow it really. I mean, I follow it more as a spe spectator than anything. Uh, my firm has not made a position on uh, whether we can buy it mm -hmm. uh, because as, as someone who holds a security license, and I am well aware of what the SEC is, has said, but as a securities firm and someone with a license, uh, compliance has to decide if it is a security or not. And if it is, then I can't buy it or I have restrictions on it. So they haven't sure. officially ruled. And then my second policy is I can't really buy it from my clients because it's not, I mean, it's not traded on the exchanges. So right. because it's not something I can really mess with, I actually don't really do anything with it. But I'm not convinced that it's going to be what everyone thinks it is. It uh, wouldn't surprise me if deflation hits, you see all these cryptos come crumbling down. That 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 is my view, and it's not a negative about what they are, it's just more of how things work in, yeah. uh, in terms of when there's a risk off event, what happens. Yeah, and part of the reason I ask that is I, I know that you're licensed, and I know that you, you there's certain things you can't do, right? You're, you're gonna be limited, and you know, that may change at some point if all of a sudden SEC says, hey, these are licensed securities, and you know you have backed, which would be a centralized exchange, you know, that might change down the road, but all right, cool. Yes, if, if there's an ETF, I mean, a real ETF, not, you know, that says, hey, this is Bitcoin or something else, well, that, that would change the game. Then, then I could totally touch it. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for coming on. I, I told you a half hour. I've already got you eight minutes overtime, but I really appreciate you taking some time. Uh, you know, I, I would love to do it again. You, you got some great content, and I think our viewers have a ton of questions that I'm sure we'd love to get answered, too. You bet. Anytime you want, Merlin, you know how to find me. And it was uh, great being on your show, and uh, we'll look forward to the next time. Sounds good, man. Take care. Thank you. Bye. All right, guys. That was Stephen Van Meter of Van Meter Financial. Ooh. I had his web page up here, actually YouTube page. What I would encourage you to do is, well, first off, for the new people who are joining the show from uh, from um, <laughs> I said Gary's from Stephen's site, hit subscribe on mine as well and join us. We do a show live every day, Monday through Friday at 2 p.m. Pacific. Um, here is the YouTube page for Stephen Van Meter. I would encourage you to check it out. He puts out a lot of great content. As I mentioned, he's got a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday where he just talks macroeconomics and runs through all the different macro pieces. Um, a lot of the things I alert you to about the upcoming trading session, which I'm just about to do, tell you what's gonna happen tomorrow. He's already kind of given a week uh, review of what's going on and what those numbers might be. And he also does a Sunday night chart session, which I think you guys will like as well. All right, 
on that note, let me go and show you what I got cooking for tomorrow. Um, there were a couple things I wanted to show for today, but the, the numbers I thought were interesting with regards to retail sales. So I will start with the retail sales numbers. I don't know why I can't find my retail sales data here. There we go. Here's the retail sales numbers for today. Take a look at these numbers. You've got Target, Viva Systems, Abercrombie & Fitch, Kohl's, Nordstrom's, AutoZone, uh, Hewlett Packard. All of those companies blow out earnings. The only one that missed was Ross Stores, but look at the results. Almost everything in there was down. I mean, okay, you had a couple that were slightly up, but when you have blowout earnings like that, that's just telling you that people are expecting so much more or that it just might be overpriced at this moment in time. So I thought that was interesting for today's earnings announcements. There is definitely more coming out here in the next couple of days, which I will show you that in a second. Here is what's happening for, or happened today. I didn't change the date. Ah, dab nab it. See, I was in such a rush to get it all done, I didn't change the date. This is actually for tomorrow. For the third, I will uh, go here and adjust it right now as we speak, just why? Because we can. But you'll notice on there, we've got some services numbers coming out for the U UK. We also have services numbers coming out for the Euro. That's gonna be at the wee hours of the morning, long before our markets open up. So I don't think we need to worry too much about those. Now, if you notice down a little bit further, we do have some services numbers coming out for the US, which is gonna be an important one. Uh, you might wanna keep your eye on those. That's gonna happen, as you can see here on the, there, I can change the date. That's gonna happen right after the market opens. So about 15 minutes into the trading session, you get final services PMI, 30 minutes in, you get ISM, and then we get crude oil inventories, which has been all over the place lately. Crude oil's been on a great trend. Uh, we'll take a peek at that one here in just a second. Now, moving on to our final piece, which will be the earnings calendar for tomorrow. Not a lot of major names. Marvell Technologies is probably the biggest one on there. You also have a retailer, American Eagle. If history is any indicator of future, well, all of those retailers beat earnings today except Ross, and their results were negative. So keep your eye on American Eagle as a potential down day tomorrow, regardless of what they do with their earnings. All right, I think that's going to do it. I got most of my questions answered. All right, what are questions you guys have for me as we wrap up here? I know uh, you were asking a whole bunch of went through there, and I, I told um, Stephen that I would, I'd have them at a half hour. I feel guilty keeping people for 45 minutes and then dragging it into an hour. Um, yeah, Thomas, the liquidity trap is something I should have asked him on because it's. I'll have to have him explain that one much deeper. But the bottom line is if we are seeing inflation in the marketplace, the natural thing to have happen, it's almost lockstep, is if inflation is there, then gold is rallying, right? Gold is a hedge against inflation historically. And if you look at the price charts here of gold, I'll bring up GLD. <clears throat> you know, you're looking at gold, it, it hasn't been rising. You know, it's been, it's been dropping. And as bullish as I am on gold long term, I agree with Steven, I think that long term, yeah, gold is gonna be a good buy. It's just at what price point? You know, we're coming into an area that I'm actually interested in, which is just a couple bucks below at 160. That'd be 1600 on gold, which is where it traversed sideways back here from uh, May, April, May, and June of 2020. And I'll map that out for you guys, put a little box around that area. You know, this is an area where it, it hesitated, which basically was just a pause where it's just kind of building some strength. Or weakness depending on which way it breaks but you know we're, we're kind of back down into that now I'm mapping out the the upper and lower bands of that box there you're kind of in the middle and I think 160 is that nice point there as a as a buy point potentially for gold going forward but you know the argument here is if we're not seeing gold rally and it's dropping like this then that might be hinting deflation because it should be moving up pronouncing inflation so there you go Pat says is Facebook going to drop <laughs> I would think so, but you look at the price chart here at Facebook, it, it really has given us no signs, has it? It's really been just kind of chopping back and forth. So, you know, if you're if you're looking for a short on Facebook, bottom line for me is it's got to get a close below 244. Until that happens, it's I think it's just going to keep traversing sideways here and not a lot of great opportunity. I think the big bull run is done for uh, Facebook, but other than that, what do we got? Um, go to Stephen's channel and you can find details on liquidity trap. Yeah, thanks, Dexter. Appreciate that. He does have, he probably has a specific video just on liquidity trap that you guys can find out there. Um, Emerald, and can you look at TGT when you get a chance? Had a huge drop into the weekly demand today with huge volume. Um, all right, let's go check out Old Target. Now, Target, of course, coming out with earnings as well. Um, the only thing I don't like about this, and you guys might remember the show with Brandon Wendell last, was it this week? God, I can't remember all the shows we have. We have so many damn shows. It was last, it was actually this week we had Brandon Wendell on. And, you know, one of his arguments is the trend is your friend to the bend at the end. And part of it is what levels are being broken. In Brandon's mind, that uptrend is broken now. Today's action broke that uptrend. Why? 
Well, we could draw trend lines on here, which is the easiest thing to do. And we'll, we can draw them at a wide variety of different locations, but I think you guys could all agree that somewhere roughly in through here would be that trend line for target, right? Well, if you're going off the trend line, you broke it. If you're going off of most recent lows, you broke it. Um, you could make the argument that you are into this demand zone down here, but I think if you get below 168, call it 169, if you get a close down below 169, I, I think that Target's going to be in some trouble here, and you'll probably see some profit taking as it starts to roll over and, and, and have a significant pullback. But um, yeah, you're, you're talking about that as a potential buy point. Yes, it could be. You just, if you are buying it, make sure that you have a stop loss in place. What I kills me all the time is someone will look at a trade like this and say, oh, I love the buy. I'm buying it at 169. Great. You buy it at 169 and then you're like, my stop loss is 168. Great. Got a dollar worth of risk per share. Trading a thousand shares. I'm risking a grand. Perfect. And the next thing you know, I talked to him six months later and I was like, oh, how'd that target trade go? Oh, I'm still in it. Well, it's at 120. You told me you're going to get at 168. Yeah, uh, it's coming back. Just make sure you have that stop loss in place. I know. I know it's funny. Steven's probably going to say, no, no, no. For the long term, don't use stop losses. I think you got to use them, especially if you are on the shorter term time frame. Um, what do I make of QQQ Wix in the monthly? It tells me that QQQ is getting very, very risky. Um, did you like the, the Russian accent there, Comrade? I don't know why I went Russian for the QQQ today, but we will look at it from a different perspective here. Hold on a second. Let me change it to a monthly chart to match your request. Um, you know, these are basically just topping tails, right? So it tells me, if you look really at the last three months of the NASDAQ, it, and three months ago wasn't that big of a deal. If we look at the, the candle right here, you've got really what is considered a long-legged doji. It's really where you have prices in the middle and it had a lot of indecision. It's the, the month of February is the one that really is interesting, right? That's that big shooting star on a monthly time frame. You guys might remember... Yesterday we talked with Bob Dunn about this, and Bob Dunn was saying you get 12 chances a year to find a shooting star on one of the indexes, on each index. You get 12 chances a year. Well, we just got one on the NASDAQ, right? You Triple Q show you on a monthly time frame here, you've got a, uh, a shooting star. So from Bob's perspective, you guys might remember my rules as well, completely unrelated by the way. I, I am, don't, Bob and I have never talked about how we trade shooting stars, but his was interesting. He does it the same way. He's saying, if I get a close below 310.88, then I'm looking to go short on the NASDAQ and other NASDAQ components. Now you could short the index, which is probably the easiest thing to do, or you could go out there and start to look for maybe specific industries which you feel might be weaker than the whole, meaning they have a greater shorter short potential. I think that Facebook might be one of those big short potential candidates if the QQQs break 310.88. So there you go. That's my take on that one. I see it hitting 120. The Qs? The Qs hitting 120? Holy cow! That would be a hell of a. I don't. I don't see that. I got. I got to say, I don't. I don't see it hitting 120. Uh, at least anytime soon. It, it could, but that's that is a long, 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 long way away from current price. So uh, I'd be a little, little skeptical with the 120 mark on it. But let me see. If, I'm trying to get the the line to move down here for you guys so you can see that as well. Now what I'll do is I will put in perspective the time frame. So this is a monthly time frame which goes all the way back into 2016. That would put us back into 2016 levels and you know now that you say that it's actually very doable. Vodka? I'm not drinking vodka today Pepe. Oh, okay. Thanks Kevin. <laughs> I thought you were talking cues. I was like wow that's, that's an ambitious target there buddy. Triple Q's all the way from where it's at now down to 120. I mean, you're talking a pretty significant 62%. Yeah, I don't think so. Let's check TGT. Yes, uh, I think you're you're probably good with that. Let's go to a weekly on target. So thanks for clarifying. Um, I do think that there's a couple stair steps here that I think you're gonna have an issue with. I, I like the 145 mark as well, and then really this big consolidation level at 120 that Kevin's pointed out. Yeah, I think that there's gonna be. <laughs> I got it. I got it, Kevin. I got it. I fixed it. <laughs> and who is saying I'm drinking vodka on this show? This isn't a Friday. And no, this is not a pint glass of vodka. I'm hydrating today, ladies and gentlemen. Excellent. All right, cool. Um, let's see. What do I got cooking for tomorrow? I didn't even go to the charts. Um, what do I cooking for tomorrow? Tomorrow, I'm going to have uh, Corey Lane on the program. Actually, Traders Army is going to do a summit on Thursday, so we'll probably talk a little bit about that. But uh, options, obviously, is uh, an, a, a very 
energetic and lively topic. Corey Lane, the rock star, will be broadcasting from his studio, both his music and trading studio, I guess. So if you guys have any questions for me or for Corey Lane, you can send them on in at tradermerlin at gmail.com. That's the easiest way to send me questions. Again, I know we have a lot of new people watching the show today, so thanks for those of you who joined us. Um, hopefully you enjoyed Stephen Van Meter. If you do, you can uh, click that little thumbs up button. Also hit the subscribe. And if you want, add, uh, subscribe to him on YouTube as well. He's got a, a pretty good following there and just a bunch of great content from a longer term perspective, which I think is great. Oh, GD says, but you said, uh, start to say one, QQQ 120 is doable. It's doable, but yep, that would, I, I think if that's where we go into like a major financial crisis. Because obviously, you look at this run from here from 2020, that retraceable, yeah, that's fine. Now, I'd have to go out to even longer term, but you know, where do we come from from the monthly time frame perspective? Uh, you know, is 120 doable? It's doable. I mean, look, I've, I saw the S&P drop 50% no problem multiple times in my trading career multiple times right multiple times uh if qq falls 120 i'm getting a gun and stashing on cash <laughs> um getting a gun might be a good thing all right um i think that having a firearm probably would be good but remember i don't think that would mean that we're in absolute economic collapse we have bubbles right these bubbles form and they pop i, I do think that the nasdaq and our equity markets are in a bit of a bubble not saying that they're going to um, absolutely die but is it unheard of to see a 50 percent drop no definitely not it's happened many times and the first couple times i saw it happen when i was uh, active back in the late 90s i thought this is never going to happen and sure enough it happened big Eb says won't happen anytime soon i agree i, I think um i think it will happen I don't know when, and I'm not going to try to make that guess. It's really about letting that market tell you that it's going to be dropping. Um, Merlin, sir. Oh, sir, you make me sound old. Don't call me sir. Uh, besides the deflation argument, would you say that some of the GLD thunder has been stolen by Bitcoin? I, I think so. I mentioned this in the show before. I think what you're having, what you're seeing is all the, not all, but many of the gold bugs, those who are devout gold, 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 gold are going, you know what? I might take just a portion of this portfolio and put it into Bitcoin. So I think that it's not stealing the thunder. I think that just there's some more attention. It's a new entrant into the space. Um, and it's not just that. I think that what's stealing the thunder is really the retail population looking at Bitcoin, kind of what it stands for, you know, against fiat money, control your own money, be in charge of everything yourself. To me, that I think is the bigger boom for Bitcoin. But yes, I do feel that um, gold bugs or people who are in the gold industry are looking at it going, I'm a fan. You talk to somebody like John O'Donnell, who I hope to get back on the program here soon. You know, John was, he's a gold bug. He's a gold silver bug. And you talk to him, he's like, yeah, I'll, I, I'll, I'll play with Bitcoin a little bit. I'm not going to focus exclusively on it, but now my attention might be split a little bit. Yeah. All right. Oh, Peter Schiff. <laughs> Peter Schiff, that guy's off his rocker, man. Sorry. Um, okay, last one. Mike LaRusso says, any thoughts on an overbought indicator? This is a really good question, and, and I want to bring up the, the full question here. I think I, I don't think I have it prepped for the show. Let me see if I do. Uh, bear with me as I try to find this one. Um, and by the way, congrats to those of you. Some of you in the room were talking about Rocket the other day, RKT, to the moon today. But talk about a short squeeze. Woo! That was a good one. I'll show you that chart in a second. Here's the question, and I don't have my normal font. I try to keep everything standardized, but I forgot the font today. Sorry. I just copied them over from the email. Uh, Michael says, what's the best indicator or holy grail you use to determine if a stock future is overbought? I hate selling too soon. I bought 10 directional calls on Rocket on February 12th, and it is up a bit today. A bit might be a little bit of an understatement. You're up over 70% today. Not quite GameStop status, but still good. I sold half my position at the stock price, about 36 bucks because it was up, and I'm holding for more. Maybe if it continues, if I get lucky, currently as I write this, it's at 43, huge volume, RSI is at 91. Okay, great question. Two things I think you did. One thing is you did great. You sold half. You're dealing with something that went parabolic, right? So let's go to the daily here on Rocket. It went absolutely parabolic. You sold at 36. There is nothing that you should feel bad about. You you killed it on those options. Are you kidding me? You absolutely crushed it on Rocket. The, the thing I'm going to do, I'm going to show you a couple of things here. Number one, I'll show you this price chart, which there is not an indicator alive. Indicator alive that's going to say that this is going to be the best time to sell it because it's overbought. 
this thing is going to be pegged to an overbought situation. And if you bring up RSI, Stochastics, MACD, Bollinger Bands, they're all going to say it's overbought, right? Alan just says it perfectly. He says, for short squeezes, indicators don't matter. Now, the only thing I would recommend here is if you are in something that's moving so parabolic that maybe what you do is you shift over to a smaller time frame, an hourly or a 15 minute time frame, and use that as your exit strategy. Because when something goes parabolic, I mean, it's hard for them to stop. Now, uh, let me see, I'll add in RSI or MACD, whatever you guys want. I'll put on, um, let's put, I like Stochastics better personally. Right, Stochastics is still saying this thing is overbought on an hourly time frame. It actually just gave me a sell signal. You can see that down here at the bottom. Let me get rid of this volume, etc. Remove volume. Um, it just gave a sell signal on Rocket. Now, if you switch this maybe to like a 15 minute time frame, it's gonna give you a sooner signal, but you see you would have gotten out many times. So it's hard to use these indicators to determine when to get out on something that goes parabolic. Now, my recommendation is when you see something that does what Rocket did on the daily time frame here, like that, I just want you all to remember three simple letters. G to the M to the E, GameStop. GameStop did the same thing, and look what happened to it. Within a few days, it went from $480, actually, let's say two weeks, $480 down to about 40. That is what happens on short squeezes and pump and dump situations, which is what's happening with Rocket. Not that Rocket can't be great in the future, not that it's not a great company, it just had a huge short interest. Of course, that's the target. Uh, you know what I should do? I should build a portfolio. Maybe that's what I'll do in my free time, which I have literally zero of. Maybe I'll build a portfolio that's long, all the heaviest shorted stocks out there. To me, that would be the best portfolio to build right now. Just sit back, wait, when they do this, when they do what Rocket did, you sell half, trail stop the second half, and call it a day. But I would not be using an overbought, oversold indicator on these ones. It's just, you know what it's going to tell you. It's telling you right now that it's way overbought. It could probably lead to more overbought. Uh, Ballhead B says short rocket. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. It's too risky. Even if you bought puts on it, you're not going to get great value. They're going to be really expensive puts right now. Um, you guys remember, when I, I shorted GameStop, uh, let's see, GME. I bought puts on GameStop when it was at 350. That's up here. That was this day, right here. This, I'll, I'll zoom out a little bit so you guys can see it. I shorted it when it was right there at 350. The next day it ran up to 480. And when I bought those options, I bought the 90s, which is right there. I bought the 90s. Is that right? Yes, I did. I bought the, I bought the 90s or the 180s. I can't remember what I bought. I think I might have bought the 180s. I don't remember. It was the 90s or 180s, but I only made 35% on the trade. 35%. And that thing dropped so much. So they're, they're incredibly inflated right now. I haven't looked at rockets, but I'm pretty sure they're inflated. Maybe we'll talk about that with Corey Lane tomorrow um, and spreads on these things, right? Shorting rocket with spreads because Corey will be much more versed and better at that than I am. All right, great questions, everybody, uh, and I'm, gl I'm glad. It sounds like you guys enjoyed having Steven Van Meter on the program today. Just a lot of great content. Um, one thing I really like about him is a lot of his perspectives are opposite of the norm. Not that he's right, not that he's wrong, but it's nice to hear perspectives, and what he does that I really appreciate is he backs them up with facts. Backs them up with facts, right? I, I love it. He's like, no, I think it's going to go this way, and here's why. Here's my argument. Every one of us can make up some case that, well, I think it's going to do this. Why? Well, because it's going to. Well, no, not really. His arguments are pretty sound. I, I really appreciate having him on today. So thank you guys for sending me that video of him. He was actually gracious enough just to come on right away. So uh, that was awesome. Let's see. Merlin, stop lying. You have been doing the George Costanza trades versus Jim Cramer forever. Well, I, I built portfolios in the past that were the inverse Cramer portfolio. And it's surprising the inverse portfolio did really well against Jim Cramer's recommendations. So whenever he says bye, 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 the next morning I would look for those as shorting opportunities. But Okay, uh, Big Eb, did I make it? One hour. This show is supposed to be 30 minutes. Okay, that'll do it for me, everybody. I gotta go look at houses. So uh, thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, if you have any comments, feedback, go ahead and email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. Topics for tomorrow's show, you can send them out there as well. It'll be an option show tomorrow with Corey Lane of Traders Army. So uh, feel free to send those questions in. Again, if you're new, hit that subscribe button. That will do it for me. All right, everybody. Have a fantastic day. Be safe out there trading. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Take care.